What's up, everybody? I'm Justin. Zach. And uh, welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study. If you have a Bible, go ahead and grab that. Romans chapter 8. We're also going to be looking at 1 John chapter 2. So if you want to go to 1 John 2 and hold your place, we're going to reference one verse there, but it's a really important one that we're going to look at. Other than that, unless the Spirit leads us down another path, we're just going to be right here in Romans 8. And tonight, we are finishing Romans chapter 8, which is cool because we've spent just <laughs> one month uh, in mm -hmm. this one chapter. First and foremost, it's one of the longer chapters in Romans. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it's very, very deep. There's a lot of very complex things here. Last week was probably the premier example of that, mm -hmm. where we talked about God's foreknowledge and, and what it means to be predestined. And So we'll talk a little about that tonight, just because there's a word here uh, in the text we're getting ready to study that reflects back to that conversation. Mm -hmm. But... Um, other than that, you know, if you want all of the detail on what we talked about last week, please go and check out that video because it's a very complex conversation. Um, it was equally complex when we did it live, you, you know, but I think everyone handled the topic really well. It was really encouraging um, because like we've said from the very beginning, you know, 21 weeks ago when we started this study, Romans is very difficult. Uh, it's, it's deep and wide and Paul's fullest explanation of the gospel. And as such, it is very um, challenging, right? And so being challenged is not always a bad thing. So if you're not being challenged, you're not growing. So this is all about that, that growth Right. So uh, what we're going to do is we will read the verses that we're going to study, then we'll pray, then we will review. And the review tonight is crucial because we're going to build off of one of the verses that he talked about. Nothing about the foreknowledge or predestination, n not really those verses, but the verse on all things working together for good is something that's going to be the foundation for everything we're talking about here. So let's read these. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 31 and reading to the end of the chapter. Beginning in verse 31, God's word says this. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is, is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Know in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's go to God in prayer here. Father God, we love you and we are so thankful for your grace that we're able to read from your word and apply it to our lives. God, I pray that we are able to take the truth of your word to heart. Uh, pray that as our knowledge of these things increases, so does our faith. We're so thankful for this time. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So last week, we only looked at four or five verses because of the nature, the depth of the conversation. We talked about God's foreknowledge and, and what it means to be predestined. And we talked about the two different camps, right, that people fall into. There's the Arminian camp and there's the Calvinist camp. We teach from an Arminian standpoint because that's what we believe the Bible to be teaching. And we went through that in, in great detail, uh, talking about God foreknowing and humans having free will. And we went in depth with that. Once again, go check out that video for all of the information. But there was a verse that we started everything out with last time, and it said, and we know that all things work together, right, for the good of those who love God. So um, we said that's a pretty abused verse, right? It uh, is one people take out of context. They talk about uh, God uh, only allows good things to happen to his people, and so it's really misused. Mm -hmm. And we, we said that in overall, God works out things for good, but... Mm -hmm. His, sometimes his people don't experience good things, right? Jesus was clear that people, his people would have trouble, right? That, that there would be persecution. And so there are some things you experience that are not good, but we said that there's like two stories to existence, right? You, you've got the upper story where God is and there's the lower story where we are and we can only see the lower story, you know, what's happening in the here and now. God sees both things, 
right? So he not only sees what's happening now, he, he sees where something is going. Mm-hmm. So in the long run, ultimately, he's making all, working out all things for good. Mm-hmm. But there will be times when you experience something that's not good. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, it, it's people take that verse to mean God only allows good things to happen to his people. But the damage that causes is when something bad happens, people are not prepared. Right? And then they look at God in, in kind of a strange way because they think, well, God never said this would happen. Mm-hmm. He very much did say, say that these things would happen. So we're going to be building off of that verse a little bit as we walk through this. And mm-hmm. we're finishing um, chapter 8 here talking about God's everlasting love. This is one of uh, my favorite portions of Scripture. Matter of fact, I've talked to lots of people lately who have said that this is one of their favorite passages. And, and for good reason. I, I mean, to understand the love of God. But first thing, let me say this. We'll talk in depth about God's love, but we certainly won't leave this evening knowing everything about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, God's love is so far beyond our comprehension. He, he loves in a way that we strive to love, but but we can't perfectly love the way that he does. And, and so um, we also have to be careful here because Paul makes a few statements talking about nothing being able to separate us from God's love, and that's true. But sometimes we can get it in our head that that gives us a hall pass to do whatever we want. And that's certainly not the case either. So what we'll do is we'll start walking through these verses. Uh, keep in mind, Paul is writing to a group of people he has never met, mm-hmm. right? He, the church in Rome, we know from Acts, had existed for quite some time, made up of Jewish and Gentile uh, followers of Christ. If you're just joining us for the first time, know that a Gentile, anybody that's not a Jew, mm-hmm. right? So if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. So the Roman church had Jewish and Gentile Christians. And there came a point when the Roman emperor Claudius expelled all the Jews from Rome. Right? Historically, we're not really sure when it happened, but ancient historians do tell us that it happened. And five years later, right, Claudius dies, and the Jews, including Jesus following Jews, are allowed to return. And when they do, they find that their church is very non-Jewish right, in custom and practice. And so by the time of Paul's day, the church is actually splitting. Right? It's a very tense time. If you've ever experienced a church split or know of someone who has, it's an ugly, ugly thing. And and that's what was happening here. It's very, very tense. So Paul writes this, right? And you have to keep in mind, what do you say to a group of people you don't know, right? But you know is going through a harsh situation. Well, first he encourages them to be unified. You see that all throughout this. But then he is giving the fullest explanation of the gospel, right? Gospel, of course, meaning good news, the good news of what Christ has done. And so now that we've arrived here, he's going to dig very deeply into the love of God, so much so that he almost struggles to find the words to, to, comp- to actually convey the, the incredible love of God. And you'll see that when we get to the end. So Romans chapter 1, uh, not 1, Romans chapter 8, <laughs> beginning in verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? So let's let's stop right there. Keep in mind that we're picking up in the middle of a section. Mm-hmm. Chapter and verses are relatively modern additions to Scripture that they weren't originally there, and it was not broken up like it is probably in your Bible. Um, so keep in mind we're, we're picking up in the middle of a conversation here. Mm-hmm. Um, he said, what then shall we say to these things? He's referring back to verses 28 to 30. Mm-hmm. Right, so let's look really quickly at verses 28 to 30, just so we know what he's referencing. <clears throat> Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. He's building off of that, right? So knowing about God's foreknowledge and that God has sort of set everything up here, right? In his foreknowledge, he has predestined those who accept a relationship with him for glory. Because he has set everything up in that way, what do we say? This is a rhetorical question. Paul Paul loves to ask a couple of kinds of questions. He either asks a question that he himself answers, or he asks a rhetorical question that you're not really looking for an answer for. It's Mm -hmm. meant to guide the reader, Mm -hmm. right, and and to get the reader thinking. So imagine hearing this read aloud, because that's really what an ancient church service was. The, The modern worship service, there's 
lots of singing and things, and I'm sure that existed in ancient services, but really, more often than not, what they would do is they would turn up for a worship service and just hear the reading of whatever letter they had, mm -hmm. right? So imagine hearing this for the first time. You hear about those whom he foreknew he predestined and, and uh, those whom he uh, predestined he called, justified, glorified. Imagine hearing all of that and then hearing the question, what do we say now? You know, it's almost as if Paul is saying, what do you think about that? Mm -hmm. you, you know, having heard this, mm -hmm. what, what, what do we say? He says this, if God is for us, who can be against us? Because God has set up all these things, right? In, in his foreknowledge, he knew there would be those who would accept a relationship with him and those who would not. But those who do are predestined for glory and to, to be transformed into the image of his son. Um, since God has set that up, right, in his incredible sovereignty, mm -hmm. the enemy, enemy, any enemy that stands in our way, uh, really doesn't have a chance. Yeah, you know, you want to. Uh, yeah, just going off of what Justin mm -hmm. said, that uh, literary wise, it's uh, it's good to picture yourself as if you were receiving this letter, mm -hmm. um, because it definitely does guide you. Um, and as you'll see throughout um, our text today, is that there's these questions that Paul will answer. Um, and he does it in a very unique way, but a, a unique way that uh, brings about the truth of a believer's uh, eternal salvation. And so we'll get more in depth to that. So mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if God is for us, who could be against us? Mm -hmm. R really, well, well, no one mm -hmm. is what he's getting at. Now, that doesn't mean that you won't have enemies. We have enemies, one particular enemy that stands in the way, right, Satan? Mm -hmm. But what, what Paul is going to dig into here is that while the enemy may fight, Right, he, he's not going to have an, a victory, right? Yeah. Christ has won the victory, won. Yeah. right? So look at verse 32. He, that would be God, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? This is another one of those verses you gotta look out for, right? So this is one of the verses that is abused a little bit. Well, God will just give us all things and they mm -hmm. use it to interpret he's giving us good wealth and good health and things like that. And, and certainly God does give us good things, right? But look at what Paul is talking about. He did not spare his own son. Note the capital S. So we're talking about a specific person. And of course, the son of God, we're talking about Jesus. Of course, God did not spare him, right? From Genesis chapter 3, 15 forward, it was the plan to send Jesus mm -hmm. to, to die in the place of humanity to undo Right, that, that, that fall that happened in the garden and the damage that, that came from that. Right? Mm -hmm. And so that's why you see um, Genesis 3.15 called the first gospel. Mm -hmm. right? There's a really theological term for it called proto-evangelion, but we don't need to dig into that. Right? So it, first gospel, Genesis, it's, it talks about the defeat of Satan and the victory of Christ on behalf mm -hmm. of humanity. That's, that's the gospel. Right? And there's always this weird thing that happens in movies about Jesus' life. Sometimes in movies about Christ's life, there's this moment he has where he realizes he's the one that's got to die. Yeah. yeah. So I guess it's got to be me. He knew the entire time, mm -hmm. right, why he was sent to earth, mm -hmm. right? And you know, if you read John chapter 1, he came from the Father full of grace and truth, mm -hmm. right? So Jesus came to die. God did not spare his only son so that we could have the chance for new life and a relationship with him. Mm -hmm. And the reason that he does that, right, is because of his grace and love. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, some people might want a lengthier explanation. Well, there's not one. That, that's the reason that God does it. Mm -hmm. it it's, he sends his son because he loves us so much, mm -hmm. you know, because originally humanity and God enjoyed this incredible fellowship. And because of sin, that relationship is fractured and God desires re relationship mm -hmm. with us. But because of our sinfulness, we don't have a way back to him. Mm -hmm. God's too holy. Man's too sinful to be in the same place. Right? Mm -hmm. So he sends his one and only son. Now imagine that kind of love, a love that would mm -hmm. kill in order to, to have a relationship with you. Now, of course, Jesus does not stay dead. Mm -hmm. Of course, he, he's alive today. Mm -hmm. But you have to think about how scandalous that sounds. Mm -hmm. I, I just reviewed a book called The Scandal of the Gospel, and it is incredibly scandalous to hear that God would allow his son to be killed so that we could have new life. And we don't deserve any of that. Mm -hmm. 
And every single time you've got this thought in your head, like God loves me, he's valuing me, he's taking me into his family, it doesn't produce a big head because you don't deserve any of that. Mm -hmm. You know, what we're discussing here is a free blood-bought gift of grace overflowing from the heart of God. Mm -hmm. You didn't earn it, didn't constrain it, can't earn more of it, Mm -hmm. but he delights to give it, right? If he didn't spare his own son, well, what else? How will he not also freely give us all things? Mm -hmm. That does not mean that God is just a giant vending machine, Mm -hmm. you know. And by the way, side note, we sometimes have to watch the way we pray because we pray to God like he's a vending machine, Mm -hmm. right? God's not just a cosmic yes man saying Mm -hmm. yes to all of all of his Mm -hmm. all of his children all the time. Does God say yes? Well, well, certainly, Mm -hmm. but God very clearly also tells people no, mm-hmm. you know, and that's something that we have to wrap our heads around. You know, there are some who are preaching that, you know, no is really not in God's vocabulary, and it absolutely is. So when it talks about freely giving us all things, yeah, the things that God does give are given freely, right? They, they mm-hmm. cost you nothing. You know, the, these these things that are overflowing from the heart of God are good things. Mm-hmm. You know, salvation right, is a free gift mm-hmm. that is available to you. Now, it's free for us, but if you were to look at like 1 Corinthians 6, it does talk about being bought at a price, mm-hmm. right? So it did cost something, mm-hmm. right? It cost the life of the Son of God, but it's free for us. Yeah. And if, you've, if you're struggling with accepting something like that, here's the thing is, is grace is the reason for that. Grace is being given something that you do not deserve. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he's talking about if he didn't, if he didn't withhold Jesus... He's not going to withhold anything else. If he freely sent Jesus, then he'll freely give the other things that we need too. Yep. Yeah. Um, going on what Justin mm-hmm. said, so um, I love to look at Old Testament parallels into this and just showing uh, God's love and what he was actually going to do for us. And uh, more importantly, this redemptive plan um, to show us um, this is the gospel, that this is what I'm going to uh, to do for you in sending my son uh, for your salvation, but in looking at verse thirty-two, it says, uh, "He who did not, uh, he who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not uh, with him also give uh, give us everything else?" Um, so the word in there, withhold, is actually the same word used um, with Abraham and, um, when he's tested uh, mm-hmm. of his faith in Genesis twenty-two eleven through twelve. So it says this: "says But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven." And said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. Uh, He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God. Since you have not withheld your son, Mm. your only son from me. Now, and think of the parallel of that whole passage. Now, uh, if you don't know the passage, um, uh, Abraham is tested in his faith. um, And God tells him, go and uh, build an altar and sacrifice your son Isaac, your one and only son. Now understand, now Abraham has two sons. He has Isaac and Ishmael, but Isaac, Isaac is the promised son. Mm. Isaac is the son that uh, through the descendants of him and through many uh, that um, that Jesus would come from. And think of that now. It's mm. Isaac. This is your only son. Now you go and sacrifice him. And so he travels on this whole journey. And as he's going to sacrifice son, um, he he willing without help holding his son he doesn't he doesn't hold him back no he says god i will sacrifice my son to do this because of my faith but obviously god stops him and says um uh don't lay your hand on a boy and he replaces uh he gives him a lamb um caught in the thicket of a thorn bush around his horns um in place of the sacrifice and i think of this parallel is that um we call we call jesus the lamb of god scripture says that but what was Jesus wearing um, on his head? He was wearing a crown of thorns. Now, mm-hmm. where is the lamb caught in uh, when it's sent by God? It's caught in the thicket of a thorn bush mm-hmm. upon his head. Mm. And it is used as a sacrifice, just as Jesus was used as a sacrifice for our sins to save us uh, for salvation. Just seeing that parallel and just understanding that from the Old Testament is that God had this plan in place, this plan to show us that I would send my son. Mm. I would send my son to go to the cross so you didn't have to endure that punishment. Mm. And that and that is the beautiful thing about God's love and seeing that is that he didn't withhold him. Right. He didn't hold him back. No, I gave him mm. for you. Mm. So 
Yeah, it, it, it's un- it's amazing when you when you really think about mm-hmm. how little we deserve it and how mm-hmm. much he has given it, mm-hmm. you know. Um, check out verse 33. Mm-hmm. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Keep that word elect in mind. We'll come back mm-hmm. to that in a second. It is God who justifies. Okay, so who's going to bring any charge against God's elect? The elect refers to those who have a relationship with Jesus. That That's, that's the elect, mm-hmm. right? Now... We have to talk a little bit about the way that that those who hold to Calvinism view things. Remember that Calvinism holds that before the creation of the world, God already predetermined who Mm -hmm. would have a relationship with him and who would not, down to the individual. Mm -hmm. Those who are predestined for heaven are called the elect, according Mm -hmm. to Calvinism. Arminianism, the elect, refers to those who give their lives to Christ. Mm -hmm. So, those who give their lives to Christ come to him understanding, right, that he's the one who justifies. To justify, right, just means being declared righteous. Mm -hmm. Because as we've said in subsequent videos, uh, we don't have any righteousness of our own, right? And we are made righteous, right, justified by faith. Paul talks about that er very early on in Romans. Mm -hmm. He talks about it in great detail. We're not justified by works, right, Mm -hmm. justified by by faith Mm -hmm. as well. Faith and works working together. Mm-hmm. Of course, if you look at James, James speaking of that. James, yeah, uh, yeah <laughs> right. Uh, so we're speaking at camp on James, so we've been knee-deep <laughs> yeah. in it over the last few weeks. Um, but um, he's talking about who's going to bring any charge, mm-hmm. right? In Christ, you know that all things are paid for, mm-hmm. right? That, that debt has been paid. Mm-hmm. There's not one thing you can do that's going to bring you back into condemnation, mm-hmm. Right? Who's going to bring any charge against those who are in Christ? God, God is looking at the individuals and saying, who's, who can, who's going to bring a charge against you? I don't. Mm-hmm. And if I don't, then no one can. Mm-hmm. Right? Who's going to bring a charge against you? You're mine. Mm-hmm. There's not a court they could possibly charge you in. Mm-hmm. Right? Everything's mine. Mm-hmm. Now, we also have to keep in mind that some people take this incredibly literally and believe that they can go out in society and commit mm-hmm. crimes and not be charged. Mm-hmm. We're talking about spiritually, eternally speaking here, mm-hmm. right? You go out and you kill someone and you're arrested, you're probably going to be charged with murder, mm-hmm. right? Right, a worldly level. So when, when we're talking about this here, we're talking about eternally speaking, mm-hmm. right? There, there's nothing you can do that's going to bring you back into condemnation. Mm-hmm. That does not mean that you can do whatever you want. Mm-hmm. N- not at all. Because you do not want to take advantage of the grace that he has lavished upon you. It's like what Paul says, shall we continue to sin that grace may Mm -hmm. abound? No, by no means. Mm -hmm. Literally, it's certainly not. You know, he says it several different ways. Mm -hmm. But it's God who justifies. No one's going to bring a charge against you. If God doesn't, then no one is. Yeah. Right. Uh. Yeah, so the judge himself declares the accused per, uh, person righteous on the basis of his faith in uh, Jesus Christ. And as a result of the ac- uh, accusations, um, they're dismissed. No one can bring an accusation uh, against you uh, because of what Jesus did mm-hmm. on the cross. And um, and thinking about this, um, I always think about uh, the woman caught in adultery mm-hmm. uh, and where um, the Pharisees bring her. Um, they bring her to Jesus and they said, we caught this woman in the act of adultery. Um, and Jesus says, if, you, if any of you are without sin, I'll let you be the first to cast a stone. I'll let you be the first to kill her with a stone. Mm. And then they all walk away um, because they know they have sin in their life. Yeah. Um, but it's the fact that Jesus' word says, where are your accusers? Because mm. they're not there. Right. It says, where are your accusers? And I think that's the, a powerful thing to reflect on. So, oh, yeah. yeah. It's one of my favorite passages. Mm-hmm. First off, just the killer statement. Yeah. Hey, if you've not sinned, you can be the first to throw a stone. Yeah. And they drop the rocks, rocks and, and leave. leave. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because well, what are they going to do? I mean, they yeah. were arrogant, but they're not yeah. going to sit there and pretend they've not sinned. Yeah. You know, they certainly are not going to say that. Mm. So they drop the rocks and leave. Mm-hmm. And I love that Jesus in that moment tells her, you know, has anyone condemned you? Mm-hmm. Then neither do yeah. I. Yeah. Now go and sin, sin. no more. Yeah. And notice that he does not say, mm-hmm. neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. Or then I really will mm-hmm. condemn you. There's, mm-hmm. There's this this overflowing of acceptance of the individual, you, you know, mm-hmm. not condoning any sinful behavior, but but loving the individual nonetheless. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what's going on here. God is certainly not condoning our sinful behavior. Mm-hmm. He, he's not a doormat yeah. that we're just going to walk on. Yeah. Well, I love you no matter what. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. You know, 
no sinning is not okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it breaks God's yeah. heart. Mm -hmm. And that's why this is not a hall pass to do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. When you understand the length that God went to to forgive the sin, mm -hmm. literally sending his son to die the most mm -hmm. grotesque, horrific mm -hmm. death you could imagine, uh, when, you, when you realize the length he went to forgive that sin, you're not so willing to dive in it and engage in the things that he came to destroy. Mm -hmm. Um. So, he says, it is God who justifies, verse 34, who is to condemn, right? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. So, let's talk about condemning, right? Mm -hmm. Those who are outside of Christ are what we, we say they're under the condemnation mm -hmm. of their own sin, right? So, that leads to a big question, right? If Christ died once for all, which he did, mm -hmm. If he has lavished the same amount of grace upon everyone, whether they realize it or not, which he has, mm -hmm. then how are those who don't accept a relationship with Christ still under the condemnation of their sin? Mm -hmm. Right? If Christ died once for all, how are some people still condemned? Which is a very fair question. Mm -hmm. And so it's relatively easy to answer, right? The forgiveness of God, right, divine forgiveness, mm -hmm. is more attune to a legal pardon, mm -hmm. right? So you think about it. A, a governor of a state decides to pardon a criminal, mm -hmm. right? That means that they are uh, forgiven of that particular crime and, and typically re released from punishment for that particular thing. Mm -hmm. But a legal pardon has to be accepted by the prisoner. Mm -hmm. There are instances where a governor has offered someone a pardon and the person has not taken it. Mm -hmm. Well, if you don't take it, then you're still condemned yeah. to face yeah. whatever punishment that is, mm -hmm. right? So Jesus has paved the way to the Father, mm -hmm. right? He's done the work. But it, it, it involves an acceptance, a repentant acceptance on our part to acknowledge that and, and, and accept that relationship. Mm -hmm. If you don't, then you're essentially saying no to the pardon, mm -hmm. right? So that's why when you see the word condemn, uh, but no, Jesus died for everyone. You know, there are those who will not accept the pardon, mm -hmm. right? Therefore, they're still condemned. Mm -hmm. um, Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Well, we've talked about that. That's, that's the essence of the gospel, Jesus mm -hmm. dying in our place, mm -hmm. you know. More than that, though, you know, it's through his shed blood we have forgiveness. Through his shed blood we have atonement. Mm -hmm. Atonement's a great word. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's one that we typically don't use anymore. And uh, atonement uh, means to cleanse or purge or, or expiate, right, the mm -hmm. sin from someone, right? So it's through Christ's shed blood that that happens, but Christ did not just die, mm -hmm. right? The, the death of Christ on the cross was absolutely not the end. Mm -hmm. It's actually the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And so three days after his mm -hmm. crucifixion, he is raised to life, right? The, mm -hmm. the, the power of the Holy Spirit raises mm -hmm. Christ from the grave. And the resurrection is absolutely everything. Mm -hmm. We would not be doing this. Yeah. We would not be in nice facilities like this mm -hmm. if Christ had not been raised. First mm -hmm. Corinthians 15, um, Paul talks about uh, if Christ is not raised, then everything we're doing yeah, is pointless. pointless. Yeah. yeah. And you have to appreciate that honesty. Mm -hmm. But we know that Christ is alive. And so because mm -hmm. he is, he's won the victory. Mm -hmm. He is now seated at the place of highest honor. And look at the language that Paul uses. Mm -hmm. It's something that's happening right now. He is at the right hand of God. Ancient times, the right hand side of a king was the place of highest honor. Mm -hmm. And so think about the, the entire king of the universe, right? Jesus is at his right hand and uh, in the place of highest honor, having won the victory. And of course, one day he will return. Mm -hmm. But while he's in that place of honor, he's doing something, mm -hmm. right? He's interceding for us. Mm -hmm. We talked about this last week, but we talked about it with the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. right? The Holy Spirit intercedes, right? Intercession, right, just means to intervene on someone else's behalf. Mm -hmm. So what Paul was talking about last week, the Spirit intercedes when we're praying, because Paul's speaking in the context of prayer, mm -hmm. When we pray, the Spirit is interceding for us, communicating that to the Father. It's not that God mm -hmm. doesn't understand you. Mm -hmm. It's that the Spirit is communicating in a way only He can, mm -hmm. right, to speak to God. Jesus is interceding too, mm -hmm. right? It, it's, it's, it is the Spirit, but you've also got Christ, right, that, that's doing the same thing. So turn with me really quickly to 1 John chapter 2. 
1 John chapter 2, I want you to see another verse that talks about Jesus um, inter, intervening or interceding. Mm -mm. 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. He uses a different term other than interceding, but it's the same thing. Okay, 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, John says this. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate, right, with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So even here in 1 John, he's talking about Christ being the one to intercede mm -hmm. along with the Spirit. Christ is our advocate, right? Mm -hmm. He's the mediator between God and man. Mm -hmm. That's what Christ is. Throughout Scripture, you've got different people who stand in that mediator spot, um, what we would call like pre-Christ figures, mm -hmm. Like Moses mm -hmm. is one of them, um, Abraham. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we, we could go on and on. But Jesus is the, the better Moses and the better Abraham and things mm -hmm. like that. So he's the true mediator between God and man. Um, and because of that, he's, he's interceding for us just as the Spirit does. Um, uh, yeah, I think uh, Justin put on that is having a um, – so going back to – so um, – we have an advocate with the Father. And then I think that's very special to really understand mm. is having that help. Um, we're in those times and those times of trouble is that we have an advocate, we have a helper. So, yeah. 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 Um, all the time. Mm -hmm. Right? It's not like we don't have the advocate if Jesus is off duty. Yeah. You know, it's all, it's consistent, mm -hmm. right? Just as with the Spirit, mm -hmm. which also means that God is never going to misunderstand you. Yeah. Right? They're perfectly communicating mm -hmm. with one another. Mm -hmm. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Mm -hmm. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? So you may have wondered, right, who, who or what can separate us from the love of Christ? And what Paul is going to eventually build to, I'll, ju I'll just tell you, is nothing. Mm -hmm. right? Nothing is going to separate God's love from, mm -hmm. from you, not in any form. And this is something that is very easy to preach but very difficult to apply. Because humans love is usually conditional, mm -hmm. right? We, we love uh, people who love us back. We love mm -hmm. people who've not wronged us. Mm -hmm. And typically, if someone has wronged us, we decide how much love we want to give that person. Yeah. Right? Uh, that's not what God is doing, mm -hmm. right? Certainly, there are going to be moments where he's upset mm -hmm. with you. You know, God does get angry, mm -hmm. of course. There are going to be moments where you've done things that... that Make him sad and break his heart. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but that doesn't mean he loves you less, right? Who can separate us? See, here, here's the way we typically think. God loves you. Let, let's think of a road with, with two forks here. God loves you no matter how, what's going on inside you, no matter what's going on outside you. Mm -hmm. Because when things are going on inside us, we, we think, I can't believe that I'm, I'm, I'm capable of thinking something like that. Mm -hmm. Surely, look how messed up I am. Mm -hmm. Surely God can't love me. And then God loves you no matter what's going on outside you. When bad things happen around you, you think, wow, look how messed up the world is. Surely God has abandoned me. And these two terrible thoughts, mm -hmm. right, the bad things that happen inside, the bad things that happen outside, they come together and make us think, well, surely there can't be a loving God. And yeah. what Paul is saying is, oh, yes, there can be. Yeah. You, you know, um, I want to say something to you that you might be a little bit of a brain buster, but mm -hmm. hear me out. There are things in your heart that you don't know about yet. Mm -hmm. And when they come up, you're going to be so disillusioned with yourself. You're going to, there, there are these dark things that come out of the human heart. When they come up, you're going to be going, I can't believe I was capable of that. Mm -hmm. I can't believe I, I could think something that drastic or that severe or that, uh, harsh mm -hmm. surely god can't love me and and yet we'll see that he absolutely does mm -hmm. things going on around you circumstantial whatever it may be of course god still loves you he's not abandoned you mm -hmm. even though these things have happened so look at the look at this list mm -hmm. right shall tribulation distress persecution famine nakedness danger or sword paul is saying you know there are these things that go on around us that make us feel as though we've been abandoned and that if we've been abandoned there's not a loving god mm -hmm. And what he's saying is, no, no, no. These things will happen. Mm -hmm. He's not saying they won't. And when they happen, it's not going to be fun. Mm -hmm. But that does not take God's love away from you at all. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's like with your parents. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I've done things that have driven my parents nuts, <laughs> right? 
but they don't love me less. They've gotten annoyed with me. Mm-hmm. They've gotten angry and disappointed at me. I've, I've done things that have made them sweat, mm-hmm. you know, probably swear if they were being <laughs> honest with, with me, but they don't love me less. You know, and, and that's that's what's happening here is mm-hmm. God might be, you, you will face difficult things and God might be disappointed in things that you've done. Mm-hmm. And then we repent of those things so that they don't happen again, but nothing's taking his love away from you. Yeah. That who shall separate us from the love of Christ is another rhetorical question. Mm-hmm. He's not looking for an answer. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he wants you to think about this. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, uh, I think Justin said it perfectly. Um, and it's all on the question is who will separate us from the love of Christ. And it's the fact that nothing, nothing will separate you uh, from the love of Christ. And these things are listed to show that not even these things mm-hmm. can separate it. Uh, like I said, just before I said, uh, our, the way we love as human, it's conditional. We right. place conditions on it. Um, I only love you if this and this and this happens. Right. Um, and if it benefits with, me, yeah, yep. yeah. But with God, it doesn't. It's an it's an unconditional love. Right. Um. It's the word agape is the greatest of all loves, and it's, it's a it's a godly love, mm. and how He loves us, and it's a love that um it's it's a divine love that um that we can't comprehend. It's just so amazing, and I think uh, Paul is hitting at that, and um and explaining that. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Mm. Uh, in that question, so that question is really powerful, very rhetoric, Extremely. but it's a very powerful question. Um, and just reflect uh, on that question too: is that, uh, and just say to yourself, what can separate me from the love of God? Right. And it'll, let that be like a daily reminder of what can separate you. And yes, you'll struggle with stuff, mm. um, but it's surely not going to separate you. Of so, course, yeah. yeah. Uh, Paul's isn't going to build on that very statement, right? Mm-hmm. Look at verse 36. As it is written, for your sake, we're being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Now, you look at the physical way it's written in your Bible. Mm-hmm. I'm willing to bet that he's gone from writing sentences to now he's writing it in stanza form mm-hmm. like this. It's because he's quoting mm-hmm. scripture. You know, he's quoting, psalm. yeah, Psalm 4422, mm-hmm. right, is what he's quoting there. Uh, psalm 44 is is a lament psalm, mm-hmm. right? Remember, there's two kinds of psalms, praise and lament. Uh, there's different authors for the psalms. That particular one's by the sons of Korah. I'm going to level with you. I don't know who that is, but they're listed mm-hmm. as as some of the authors of the psalms. And so Paul is, is talking about the fact that the Bible's clear that Christians will often face hardship, and they will, may mm-hmm. even be slaughtered, mm-hmm. Right? Right, that they, they face that, but still, that does not take God's love away. Mm-hmm. Right, God's love is persistent. Mm-hmm. Right, no matter what is happening. So let's let's go back in, in our minds to uh, verse twenty eight, mm-hmm. right, Romans eight twenty eight. All things work together for the good of those who love God. Again, that's an abuse thing. There right. are some things that happen to us that are not good, you know. Right. But what we're talking about there is long term, mm-hmm. right? There will be instances where you face a slaughtering or whatever it may be, mm-hmm. you know. But long term, God is working out things for the good of His children, even mm-hmm. the even things that are really tough in the moment. Mm-hmm. So I was talking with Zach about this right before we started filming, and the best example I think that can come uh, from all things working together for good in the long run, mm-hmm. right, appear in the Old Testament in a place called Dothan. Now, if you've never heard of Dothan before, I completely get it. I mean, it's not, it's not one, it's not like, you know, Egypt or Canaan or one of these places, you know, it's, uh, Dothan is a small place at first in Genesis. It's a small place. And in Genesis, something happens in Dothan you're probably familiar with. Uh, Joseph is thrown into a well, right, by his brothers. And in that well, Joseph pleads with God. And I'm paraphrasing, but he, he pleads you know, God, please don't let me be you know, sold as a slave. Please don't let me die here. And what does God do? Nothing. Mm-hmm. At least it seems that way. And Joseph is sold into slavery, and he is sold to Egypt. And for a while, he has a really rough go of things. Mm-hmm. Even after he gets into Potiphar's house, he has a really, really rough go of things. Mm-hmm. Right? Later on in the Old Testament, Dothan is a really big city, and you get this prophet named Elisha. Mm-hmm. Not to be confused with Elijah. Elijah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so Elisha. And to make a long story short, there is a large foreign army outside of the walls of Dothan. Mm-hmm. And um, Elisha is pleading with God for 
safety. Please deliver us. Please save us. Mm -hmm. And this time, God sends fiery chariots and angelic messengers, and that enemy army is completely wiped out and everybody's saved. Mm -hmm. God is just as active in the seemingly no answer to Joseph as he was in the immediate answer to Elijah. Mm -hmm. You know, because Joseph had to be sold into slavery, had to work for Potiphar, had to be unjustly accused of sexual assault and thrown into prison in order to become second command of Egypt and save all of his family and Egypt from starvation. Mm -hmm. So God takes a horrible instance and eventually works it out for good. Matter of fact, Genesis 50, uh, Joseph says, what you meant for evil, brothers, God meant for good. And he did the exact same thing with Elijah, only he responded immediately. So don't think just because there's a delay in things, God is any less active. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, he is working out things together for good. Mm-hmm. You know, um, Anything you'd like to add to 36? Uh, no, I think you hit it perfectly. Okay, so, yeah. so check out 37. No, and the no is... Um, he's kind of answering the rhetorical <laughs> question yeah. Yeah, up at the top, so... Verse 35, who shall separate from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Verse 37, no. Mm -hmm. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now, the key to this, this is another abused verse. Mm -hmm. The key to this is through him who loved us, right? So, no, nothing is going to separate us, Mm -hmm. right? But the hope is that as you experience these things, like facing death all day long, whatever, you cling more to Christ. Mm -hmm. And as you cling more to Christ, you begin to be a conqueror. It's not in and of yourself Mm -hmm. that you conquer these things. We're more than conquerors through him, Mm -hmm. right, Uh, who loved us. Yeah. Um, I think just, yeah, tagging on to that is that, uh, that there's more to this life. Like, we don't just do it just to do it. But we do it because we want to grow uh, more like Christ. We want to grow in our relationship to Christ. And I think um, in reading that, Paul really drives that statement. So, yeah, Absolutely. Verse 38 and 39, we'll read them together. For I am sure, I'm going to stop there and tell you that the Greek is convinced, mm-hmm. right? It's, he doesn't just say, I'm sure. Because that's something in the modern vernacular we say. It's like, oh, I'm sure. Yeah. You know, what he's saying here is I'm deeply convinced mm-hmm. is what the Greek is. I'm deeply convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here, Paul is actually struggling to find the words, Mm -hmm. right, to talk about God's incredibly certain love for believers, Mm -hmm. right? Nothing, he says, nothing in heaven, nothing below earth, nothing above it, nothing on earth, nothing can separate us from that love of God, right? Mm -hmm. God has looked at humanity and said, you are mine, Mm -hmm. you know, no one can condemn you, Mm -hmm. you belong to me. Mm -hmm. And Paul is actually, he's not exaggerating here. Mm -hmm. He just is so certain that nothing can separate us from God's love. He's Mm -hmm. actually having a hard time trying to describe how certain God's Mm -hmm. love really is. Yeah, um, and understand uh, in verse 38 through 39 that God is naming everything in creation, mm-hmm. every little thing in creation, and nothing can uh, separate uh, God's purpose for uh, believers in Christ. Uh, and it, this ending, these ending two verses are a climactic way uh, to wrap up chapters like five and eight. Mm-hmm. Um, and it affirms the certainty of a, uh, of a believer's salvation, how we can trust God and what he's doing. And what he is doing is uh, perfect in every little way. Mm-hmm. So, Absolutely. And, and, and with that, mm-hmm. we have finished chapter eight. It <laughs> took us a month. <laughs> uh, you know, to get through 39 verses, mm-hmm. but there's so much happening here and so many things we need to look at. Mm-hmm. But um, with that being said, you know, we'll conclude the the uh, study guide for this video is in the description here. If you have questions, my email is in the description of this video. Mm-hmm. Two services on Sunday, Wednesday night Bible study will not meet next week because we will be at church camp, yeah. but it'll, it'll, it'll convene right mm-hmm. the week after that. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, thank you guys so mm-hmm. much for tuning in. If you have prayer requests, make sure that you send those to me too. And, uh, Zach, do you want to pray us out? Yeah, most definitely. All right. Yeah, let's pray. Uh, God, we come to you in this time, Lord, and we just acknowledge that, Lord, you are, 
um, a great God. Uh, you are holy and you are creator over all things, Lord, and you have all power. Um, and God, uh, let's just reflect on that, Lord, that you are just this great creator, this God. But Lord, you want us and you want us to re, uh, want to have a relationship with us, Lord. And let us reflect uh, upon that. More importantly, reflect on uh, the word that we heard today. Um, let us open our minds and our hearts to what we heard, uh, what we discussed and talked about, Father God. Um, and let us cherish us, uh, cherish it in our heart, Lord. Uh, and that is your love, that your love that uh, never separates. Um, but God, it's a it's a relentless love and an unconditional love, Father God. And thank you for that, Lord. Let us trust you with all our hearts and let us go upon our day, Lord, just reflecting on who you are and your uh, and your divine love. So we pray this in your heavenly name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. Have a great week.